Well, welcome back for another guest series on the Sicilian Secret Diet podcast. My name is uh, Giovanni Campanile, MD. And I'm Sandra Campanile, MD. And today we are thrilled to have Dr. Nathan Bryan, who is a world authority on nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is near and dear to my heart because it's a it's a chemical that's fundamental for life and fundamental for proper heart function. And as a cardiologist, I talk about this and I use this for treatment, both from a dietary standpoint and from a medicinal standpoint for my patients. He's globally recognized as an authority in this area, and he's assistant professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. He has been credited with multiple discoveries and patents of nitric oxide, and he has been published extensively in peer-reviewed and scientific journals. Here we are introducing to you and to us, Dr. Nathan Bryan. All right, well, Nathan, well, welcome to the Sicilian Secret Diet Plan, and thank you for uh, your time. So um, we, you know, we want to get right into this. Um, you know, as a cardiologist, I'm super interested in nitric oxide. You know, I think it's one of the fundamental molecules, and uh, I, I'm constantly explaining this to patients and doctors. I actually give your book, one of your books anyway, to doctors to help them understand the importance. And But I, I still find very few people understand or know what nitric oxide is. And why do you think that is? And, and if you could explain it to our, our listeners what it is. and Well, you know, we know historically it takes on average about 17 years for new discoveries to become mainstream or, or certainly be integrated into clinical practice. You know, nitric oxide is one of these molecules that was discovered in the late 80s, early 90s. So, you know, we're, we're only about 25 years out since its discovery and, you know, since the Nobel Prize was awarded uh, for its discovery. So this takes time. The other thing is, you know, I think what's, what's kind of hindered the awareness around nitric oxide is there's no safe and effective drug around nitric oxide. So, you know, most physicians who operate in the standard of care, obviously they have prescriptive medications approved by the FDA to, to treat their patients. So there's not a nitric oxide drug, so it's kind of hindered that. You know, we're working on FDA-approved drugs, but, you know, I, I, like you, understand the importance of nitric oxide, especially in cardiology, but it's a, it's a signaling molecule that's produced in the lining of the blood vessels and the endothelium, and then it's gone in less than a second, but during its very short period of when it's produced, it activates a number of signaling pathways. So it causes smooth muscle relaxation. So the smooth muscle around the blood vessels dilate uh, and relax, causing an increase in blood flow and oxygen delivery. It's very important in mitigating vascular inflammation and preventing platelets from clotting. And this adhesion molecule, like overexpression that we see in cardiovascular disease. So uh, nitric oxide is one of the most cardioprotective, cardioregulatory molecules produced throughout the entire body. So when you lose the ability to make it, a lot of bad things happen, right? You get high blood pressure, you get sexual dysfunctions, people become hyperactive, and you increase your risk of heart attack and stroke. So it's also protected for the brain, not just for the heart, right? That it's multiple. Yeah, absolutely. So as you guys recognize, every organ and tissue and cell in the body is dependent upon the integrity of the blood vessels that supply that organ. So if you have endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries, then obviously you're going to have endothelial dysfunction in the cerebral arteries and the blood vessels that supply the, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, really every organ in the body. And it's also very important for the cardiorespiratory cycle and the mitochondrial function. And if you could elaborate on that, that would be uh, yeah, so this, and that fascinating. Yeah, in 2015, my good friend Jonathan Stanler, who was, I think, then at Duke, now he's at Case Western, discovered that the cardiorespiratory cycle is a three-gas system. You know, so when we breathe in oxygen, you know, we deliver that oxygen to cells and tissues, and then we pick up carbon dioxide, and then we excrete that through ex exhaled breath. But you don't get oxygen uptake, and you do not get oxygen delivery without nitric oxide being produced and being bound to a hemoglobin, a single hemoglobin or single cysteine residue in the beta chain of hemoglobin. So, and we we recognize this in in COVID over the past three years, uh, as you guys certainly know that the problem with with COVID is the hypoxemia and the loss of blood oxygen saturation. And so you put them on 100% oxygen, even a mechanical vent, and you can't improve their blood oxygen saturation. 
because they failed to recognize the importance of nitric oxide. So in our nitric oxide drug trial, we could take patients with a blood oxygen saturation of 78, and simply by giving them nitric oxide, we could improve blood oxygen saturation to 96 within eight minutes of just breathing room air. So the problem in any respiratory infection, especially COVID, is the loss of the oxygen carrying capacity of blood because of the decrease in nitric oxide. So that's extremely important in, you know, in kind of regulating the cardiopulmonary cycle. And then you mentioned mitochondria. You know, my, nitric oxide is what induces mitochondrial biogenesis. It's what controls the efficiency of oxygen utilization to make cellular energy or ATP. So again, without nitric oxide, uh, you don't get efficient oxygen delivery. You develop mitochondrial dysfunction. And obviously those are hallmarks of every single age-related chronic disease. So maybe for our audience, we should say a little bit about what a mitochondria is and why we need to protect the mitochondrial function. For sure. So the mitochondria are the, the kind of the powerhouses of cells. And, you know, especially in cardiac myocytes, they're really enriched in, in mitochondria. So they're the what creates the currency of the cell to actually do its job, whatever function that cell may be. So the, the mitochondria would take oxygen and convert it into ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. So when you're, you know, it's kind of like going from a, an electric or hybrid vehicle that's getting 50 miles to gallon, where if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, you know, your efficiency may be five miles per gallon, right? So we have to enhance the efficiency of oxygen utilization and energy production in every cell. That's amazing. So cardiorespiratory function, mitochondrial function, heart function, brain function, anything else? <laughs> it's, well, I think it's, it's like amazing. That This is why it's fundamental. And but, Yeah, and sexual function. You know, yeah, one of the earliest signs and symptoms of loss of nitric oxide production is, is erectile dysfunction because nitric oxide is what controls and regulates blood flow upon demand. So if you can't dilate the blood vessels of the sex organs because the cells can't make nitric oxide, then you don't get engorgement and you develop sexual dysfunction. But the similar thing happens even in the brain. If we're trying to recall memory where we left our keys or, or, or where we left something, then we have to increase perfusion to certain regions of the brain to recall memory. And that's dependent upon the production of nitric oxide. So now we're finding that people with mild cognitive disorders, either through spec scan or functional MRI, have a reduced perfusion or hypoperfusion to certain regions of the brain. And now if we open that up through nitric oxide, we can improve perfusion to certain regions of the brain and cognition improves. And how do you measure that? Let's say you you want to help uh, age, the aging population to improve memory, to delay aging on cognitive decline. How do you measure that? Well, there are standardized um, kind of recall exams, so standardized cognition exams where they really recall things that previously seen or put things in order. So these are standardized in terms of, uh, you know, mild cognitive disorders and even vascular dementia. And then we correlate that with either spec scans, these non-invasive imaging that looks at really perfusion of certain regions of the brain, or even functional MRI, so with different imaging modalities. And then so... We've correlated now, we've done a small study where we can see an improvement in perfusion as well as an improvement in cognition that correlated with the improvement in, in blood flow. So we think, and we have evidence that really the, the earliest stage in every major chronic disease is loss of regulation of blood flow and then the inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction that results from that. Yeah, I think you're do, you mentioned uh, before we got on that you're doing a... Uh study for Inaka. Inaka is uh, ischemia with no coronary disease. Uh, you know, typically, you know, when uh, we get blood clot, not blood clots, we get blockages in our arteries, that's coronary disease. But then there's a condition of Inaka where there is no coronary disease, but you still get low blood flow or ischemia. Can you uh, tell us about that? Because that's fascinating. There's really no good treatment for this. Yeah, so uh, obviously as a cardiologist, I'm preaching to the choir, but these are, you develop symptoms, the patient develops symptoms of, you know, exertional angina or this ischemic uh, pain that we call angina. But then if you take them to the cath lab and do an angiogram, you can see that their large arteries are really completely free of any obstruction or stenosis. But the small vessels coming off the main branches 
are kind of chronically contracted or constricted. So I think it's recognized now that it's a microvascular disease. It's not a large artery disease. It's a microvascular disease. So again, when all regions of the heart aren't getting sufficient blood flow because of microvascular disease, then you still develop ischemia, which by definition is reduced or low blood flow. Um, so that's the basis of kind of the diagnosis, ischemic non-obstructive uh, coronary disease. And now we're finding that our nitric oxide drug that we're now putting through phase three clinical trials uh, with the FDA is very effective at opening up those small blood vessels and relieving the ischemia from an open. That's great. But now the another thing where Sandra and I are very focused in because our you know our focus is nutrition and lifestyle changes. So the the gut microbiome and the mouth microbiome and our microbiome in general, uh, you know, is very important for our health. And I think it's very much connected to production of nitric oxide. I, mean, I would really love to hear about that. It is. See, now, now we recognize that there's two ways the body makes nitric oxide. The first pathway to be discovered was in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, through the conversion of arginine to nitric oxide, and that's the enzyme that's found in the endothelial cells. And in fact, that enzyme is what becomes dysfunctional uh, the older we get, and we, we term that endothelial dysfunction. But, you know, about 20 years ago, we discovered a pathway that whereby diet and nutrition could provide a source of nitric oxide. And this comes primarily in the form of nitrate-rich vegetables. So whether it's, uh, you know, the darker the vegetable, typically the higher nitrate concentration. And this is different than organic nitrates like you prescribed for, for angina. So uh, this isn't organic nitrates like nitroglycerin or isodyl or isosorbide mononitrate. These are naturally what we call inorganic nitrates, naturally uh, occurring salts that when you consume them in the vegetables, they dissociate into anions. And then the nitrate found in those vegetables is actually taken up in our gut and then concentrated in our salivary glands. So now after a meal, a nitrate-rich meal, for the next six, eight, ten hours, we secrete nitrate in the saliva. And then the nitrate-reducing bacteria found on the dorsal part of the tongue metabolize nitrate into nitride, and then when we swallow our own saliva, we get a burst of nitric oxide in the lumen of the stomach. So this, this pathway is dependent upon three things. Number one, you have to get enough nitrate from the vegetables. And we published years ago that the standard American diet, or what we call the SAD diet, right. you're not getting near enough nitrate uh, from the diet. Number two, it's dependent upon the oral microbiome. And there's 200 million Americans that wake up every day and use mouthwash killing and eradicating these bacteria. And, you know, we published that that causes an increase in blood pressure due to the disruption of the oral microbiome. And then the last step in that process is dependent upon stomach acid production. And, you know, there's 200 million prescriptions written for antacids every year. And that's not even counting the over-the-counter purposes. So Americans are really disadvantaged in their ability to make nitric oxide. Number one, the Western diet doesn't provide nitrate. Two out of three Americans use mouthwash. And many people, too many people, are on an acid. It's completely shutting so, down. So low acid is a problem, not high acid. Yeah, low acid. So whether you're using an antacid or you have an achlorhydria for, for whatever reason, either it's age-related, age-related achlorhydria, then all of this leads to a reduction of nitric oxide production. But the good news is, you know, we understand that mechanism to where you can actually overcome that. And I think that's why it's so important, your Sicilian secret diet, because mechanistically we can account for or explain partly the benefits of that type of dietary pattern in, in nutrition. And then you've got to get people off mouthwash and fluoride-based toothpaste and then get people off antacids. Now we can kind of prime this nitric oxide production pathway and overcome a lot of problems that are poorly managed today. Can we measure it? Like, is there a test for us to measure who has enough and who is deprived who needs the, to increase the fruits and vegetables? Well, typically we rely on symptoms. You know, we touched briefly on this. So if you have an unsafe elevation of blood pressure, which is two out of three Americans, then typically you're, you're nitric oxide deficient. You develop or have sexual dysfunction, that's a sign and symptom of nitric oxide deficiency. Uh, there's a clear role of nitric oxide in insulin signaling. So if you're insulin resistant, type 2 diabetic, because you're nitric oxide deficient. And that's really dependent upon kind of the total body nitric oxide production. So to figure out what's wrong in individual patients, there's two tests we have to perform. 
The first one is a, it's called you know venous occlusion plethysmography. So it's it's a long word, but basically it tells us how how well the endothelial cells are producing nitric oxide. The other one, you know, I developed a salivary test strip, maybe I think in 2010, and you can apply a bit of saliva to the end of this test strip, and if it turns bright pink, then that tells us that this enterosalivary circuit is working or can tell us, not necessarily does tell us, it can tell us. The problem and what people have to understand is that there's many false positives uh, on that test. So, you know, this first came to my attention. We had like a 50-year-old overweight, hypertensive, diabetic with erectile dysfunction. We test his saliva and it lit up like a Christmas tree. Well, obviously that guy is not replete in nitric oxide because he had all the clinical symptoms of insufficient nitric oxide production. Come to find out he had an, an active oral infection. So those false positives were a local immune response, either in the gingival tissue or some uh, oral infection that has nothing to do with systemic nitric oxide production. So what you're saying is that if we have uh, patients that are somewhat elderly, they may have these symptoms and these high blood pressure, erectile dysfunction, you can just assume that they have low nitric oxide in their system. That's right. That's right. Those are all bona fide signs and symptoms of insufficient nitric oxide. And, and then, then you can, yeah, then you can start to interrogate them. Number one, obviously, you know, what are they eating? Can you change their diet? If they're using mouthwash, they have to get off mouthwash. If they're on antacids, they have to get off antacids. Uh, and then you can start interrogating them and asking the right questions to get to the root cause of why they're deficient in nitric oxide. Does exercise help? Exercise certainly helps. You know, the field of nitric oxide is very complex and complicated, but diet and nutrition are kind of the, you know, tried and true uh, regimens or strategies that can overcome many poorly managed chronic diseases. However, exercise only works, so it, it's what we call it stimulates nitric oxide production, but it, it's dependent upon the function of the enzyme in the lining of the blood vessels. So if you've got a patient with endothelial dysfunction, you can start them exercising, but until you recouple that enzyme, they're never going to get nitric oxide being produced by exercise. In fact, that's why people fail on exercise stress tests, because they're unable to produce nitric oxide in the coronary arteries to dilate the coronaries to increase the to, to meet the increased metabolic demands on the heart. So it's 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 diagnostic for uh, endothelial dysfunction, ischemic heart disease, and insufficient nitric oxide. But in young, healthy people with a good endothelium, that's the reason why exercise can lower blood pressure. It's cardioprotective because it's stimulating the release of nitric oxide. And it sounds like it also improve performance, exercise performance. Yeah, a number of clinical studies show that, yeah, it improves performance, and it goes back to affecting the, the energetics of the mitochondria. So you become really a well-trained, well-oiled machine that, uh, you know, exercise, nitric oxide production predicts exercise capacity. The more NO you produce upon the initiation of exercise, the better performer you are. So in the functional medicine world, sometimes uh, what's used are supplements that are L-arginine, citrulline. Yeah. Are these effective ways to increase nitric oxide? Not at all. In fact, they should be contraindicated. You know, there are a number of studies that date back to 2006 where a large-scale clinical trial, they tried to give arginine to post-infarct patients with good intention, right? If you could improve nitric oxide production post-infarct, then could you improve uh, recovery and cardiac function post-infarct? And in that study, the arginine actually led to a higher mortality, about a 50% higher mortality in post-infarct patients than the placebo. Wow. So L-arginine should, should not be recommended for post-infarct patients. They repeated that trial in patients with peripheral artery disease. Same thing happened. Intermittent claudication uh, got worse. Patients got worse. And so uh, arginine should not be given to patients with endothelial dysfunction because we're never out of arginine, right? Our body makes enough through the urea cycle and through the breakdown of proteins we get in our diet. Uh, the problem is the body has lost the ability to utilize arginine to make nitric oxide. And citrulline's really... Citrulline is a byproduct of nitric oxide production. In most biological systems that you guys know, there's feedback inhibition. So if you're giving byproducts of NO production, it leads to feedback inhibition on its production. 
So, so arginine, and citru- yeah, arginine and citrulline products are useless in terms of like, promoting yeah. nitric oxide. If they're used quite extensively in the integrative medicine world, as you probably know. What, what's your feeling about these tests, these blood tests? Like we do a lot of biomarkers and there's, we sometimes measure ADMA and SDMA. Do you, do you feel those are effective ways of measuring nitric oxide uh, levels in the body? Well, you know, these are modified arginine um, derivatives that can act as a competitive inhibitor to binding of arginine to the nitric oxide synthase enzyme. Um, so obviously when you're competing for the same binding site for two molecules, then, you know, sometimes the ADMA and the SDMA outcompete the arginine and it will lead to an inhibition of nitric oxide production. So I think they're very useful biomarkers. Um, and we're finding that the use of antacids, specifically proton pump inhibitors lead to an increase in ADMA and SDMA. So you think that is a, you know, an elevated ADMA or SDMA is an indication that the NO may be low. Is that That's right. Okay. Absolutely. Mechanistically, we certainly understand that. Pattern. That's great. And what about, you know, we, we recommend to our patients sauna very frequently for a variety of reasons. You know, detoxification, it helps. Right. There's good data about heart disease, prevention. Depression, how, anxiety. How does this really affect good. nitric oxide? Well, if what you talk about an infrared sauna or just saunas in general? Well, we, we recommend both, you know, traditional and yep. infrared saunas. Well, I prefer the infrared sauna because you're really getting two types of therapy. Number one, the infrared light can actually penetrate into the skin and release nitric oxide that's uh, bound to metals. But then obviously it creates heat. So we're, we're, it's allowing us to sweat as a major, um, you know, source of detoxifying, the detoxification. So, you know, I, like you guys, I sit in the infrared sauna every day. Typically, first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, I'll turn on my infrared sauna. So I'm getting the red light therapy. I sweat for 20 or 30 minutes and probably talks about. But what we find is that you can actually uh, improve the efficiency of sauna or infrared sauna by taking nitric oxide prior to it. So both from the detoxification pathway, we're opening up the blood vessels and kind of helping mobilize the toxins. And then two, if you titrate up these preformed, what we call photo labile stores of nitric oxide, now if you expose these patients to light, then they're releasing that nitric oxide more efficiently, more effectively, and you get a better therapeutic effect for red light therapy, whether it's an infrared sauna or some other type of infrared light therapy. So what? How do we give our patients the nitric oxide before the sauna? Is it a supplement or, or, be- before, then- or before the exercise and then sauna? Yeah. Is it through exercise? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Is it through supplements or is it through food? Well, obviously, you know, I think our first line of should always be diet and nutrition, right? But again, we published on this, I think, in 2015. It's very difficult to quantify or to predict if you're getting enough nitrate from your diet. Because we published, you know, the same vegetables from five different cities across the U.S., you know, had a 50 to 100 time fold variability in their nitrate content so for instance celery in dallas is much different than celery in in new york new york city uh so when you know if you don't know whether you're getting enough from your diet then obviously you have to supplement i mean the same principle holds for magnesium or iodine or selenium If you're not getting those from your diet then you almost have to supplement so what we do is something different than anybody else in the industry you know i've been in the nitric oxide field for about 25 years i have I don't know, two or three dozen issued patents. And so we've commercialized a lot of nitric oxide technology uh, over the years. So what we do is we have a nitric oxide releasing lozenge. And when you put this lozenge in your mouth, it takes about five to six minutes to completely dissolve. And that liberates about 20 to 30 parts per million nitric oxide gas over that five to six minutes. So if your body can make nitric oxide, we do it for you. It's not dependent upon the bacteria. It's not dependent upon stomach acid production. We overcome all those deficiencies. But very importantly, we understand what leads to NOS uncoupling and endothelial dysfunction so we can actually recouple the NOS enzyme and through that technology, improve the body's own ability to make nitric oxide. And that's never been been done before, at least in, in the nitric oxide uh, literature. So yeah, this, this is very simple and convenient way. You just pop a lozenge. You know, I pop a lozenge as I'm getting into the sauna. And so I sit in the sauna for 25 or 30 minutes. 
that lozenge is dissolving. And then for the last, you know, 20 minutes, it's circulating throughout my body. It's being activated by the light. Uh, and you can potentiate the effects of that. So you have this synergistic effect, right? And we also know that the vegetables themselves have a synergistic effect because they they have other, like vitamin C or antioxidants that help together. Right. Yeah, you know, I think that you make a very good point. So when, when we quantify kind of the nitric oxide index of vegetables, we're looking at kind of two main nutrients, obviously nitrate or nitrite. But you can't forget that vegetables contain many other phytonutrients that we kind of ignore, but you know, not ignore uh, because they're not important, but ignore because they're not really doing anything towards nitric oxide, what we're focused on. But yeah, vegetables are providing many sources or sources of many nutrients, vitamins, trace minerals, uh, other phytonutrients that are extremely health promoting and, and cardio protective and even in, in helping the body heal or recover. So you've told us a little bit about what you do to enhance your nitric oxide, um, the sauna, the, the lozenger before. What else do you do? Well, you know, I travel a lot. You know, I travel 140, 150 air miles a year. I'm on a plane usually every week um, going somewhere. But typically, and you know, it's it's very difficult to do all the right things when you travel that much. It's very difficult to eat a, a healthy meal. So what I do every day, I do a 16-hour fast. I usually eat my last meal of the day around 5.30 or 6 p.m. And I don't eat again until noon or lunch. And I think the evidence on caloric restriction and intermittent fasting is, is pretty impressive. You know, you can induce uh, the PGC-1 alpha activated by the sirtuins. You get mitochondrial biogenesis. You turn on a lot of um, fat metabolizing enzymes. Um, and then I just try to control portions. You know, I eat a balanced meal. Uh, I'm not a big fan of these extreme diets, pure vegan, pure carnivore. I think we need a balanced diet in moderation to get the nutrients we need. I'm a big so, fan of... So you like a Sicilian secret diet because that's what no, we... Or an omnivore <laughs> diet. <laughs> I have. I read that book about a year ago. And, you know, it's... Look, it makes sense scientifically and mechanistically. And the nutritional epidemiology that's been studied for decades now, or centuries, is 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 obvious, right? There's obvious health promoting um, characteristics of that diet. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of that, or a big fan of that. Diet. And then two, I try to get at least twenty or thirty minutes of exercise of some sort uh, per day, whether it's just a you know a twenty thirty minute jog around the the hotel or in the gym, or if I'm doing push ups or set ups in my room. But I always have to find at least 20 or 30 minutes a day to do some type of uh, exercise regimen. What about sleep? You know, we're, we're also very focused on sleep. Uh, how does that tie in with the whole nitric oxide story? Well, you know, when, when we sleep, our body repairs and regenerates. Um, and part of that is dependent upon sufficient oxygen delivery, which then stimulates or is part of the nitric oxide production. So getting good sleep is critical for not just for nitric oxide, but for all aspects of health. Uh, but people with, you know, obstructive sleep apnea, people that are mouth breathers, bypass the nitric oxide production pathway. So when they're sleeping, they're not getting the nitric oxide they need. They develop, you know, apnea and hypoxemia through the night and they wake up feeling tired uh, and their body doesn't repair and regenerate through that. Uh, but certainly... You know, six to eight hours of sleep at night is absolutely essential. And so I try to do that, especially if I travel, you know, coast to coast or even international. You know, that makes it even more difficult because your body needs time to adapt to those new time zones. Um, but, you know, I take uh, some sleep aid sometimes, some melatonin. Um, you know, I try to, you know, whether it's prayer or meditation before I go to bed and kind of you know, I don't sleep with any lights on and no TV on, so I think it's important to have a really dark room. Uh, but yeah, sleep is critically important, and nitric oxide is an important part of healthy sleep patterns. So a lot of people, especially women, are also interested in the benefit that the nitric oxide and the diet has on skin. And and I know that you have a company. Yeah. Yes, specialize in that. So tell us a little bit more about that because I'm sure there are a lot of people very interested in hearing that. And I was very lucky to use your product. And I can say that I loved it 
and clearly was able to see a difference, no doubt about it. Well, your skin looks really, really beautiful. So congratulations on what you're doing. Look, the skin is an organ just like the heart and the brain. And if those organs don't get enough blood supply, then they fail, right? So the skin fails. And what does that look like? Well, you lose collagen, you lose hydration, fine lines and wrinkles start to appear. You develop dermatitis, even acne. So the skin is an outward reflection of really internal health, right? And obviously, you guys are extremely healthy, and it's reflected in the way your skin looks. So I developed a nitric oxide topical skincare line, I guess maybe four years ago in 2019. But similar to the, uh, what we do internally, we, we developed a dual chamber nitric oxide serum that when you combine these two chambers, they release nitric oxide. And so you take one pump from each side, you mix it together in the palm of your hands and you apply it to the face, neck and decollete and it generates nitric oxide gas penetrates you know, several millimeters into the skin where we recruit capillaries, improve blood flow. And you can actually see this product working right before your eyes because your skin will turn a, a slight pink, uh, reflective of the increase in blood flow. Now we have four published uh, peer-reviewed clinical trials on the serum. Fine lines and wrinkles go away, very effective, but uh, you know, even acne, although it's, you know, it's not a topical drug, it's a topical uh, skin care, but we've gotten very good results. Uh, with that, we get an improvement in collagen deposition, hydration, tone, texture, and clarity of the skin improve. And it's really a new new category in skin care because, you know, as you guys are aware, most skin care products are designed to mask or hide the underlying issue. What we do through nitric oxide is get to the, the root cause of poor skin uh, and, you know, poor texture and tone of the skin. Uh, so it's been remarkable in the effects we've seen. You know, it's really transformative in as little as uh, 30 days, people using the serum once or twice a day. Is that, fro- is that a vascular effect to the skin? That, uh, is that- it is a vascular effect, yeah. So nitric oxide is penetrating into the, you know, it's not going to reach penetrate into the skin to reach, you know, arteries or arterioles, but certainly can recruit capillaries, dilate superficial blood vessels, uh, and improve perfusion collagen deposition and improve hydration of the skin. So congratulations. Yeah. You have discovered all these things to have worked so hard to, to figure all of these things out. Well, thank you. What I'm, what I'm most excited is that, you know, understanding the results we got with the skincare, we've now submitted INDs to the FDA to develop a topical drug for diabetic, non-healing, and even pressure ulcers. And so this has been, you know, we the number of clinicians that have used it in, you know, places like Mass General and Yale, really some top wound care centers around the U.S. They said this, this is unlike anything they've seen in 60 years in wound care. Wow! You know, because to heal a wound, you have to really do two things: you have to kill the infection, which most non-healing ulcers are infecting, and then you got to get blood flow to that ischemic wound, and nitric oxide does both. It kills the infection, causes hyperemia to the wound, get tissue granulation, and we're taking three and four-year-old non-healing diabetic ulcers, and we heal them within a period of months. Very good. That's amazing. That is exciting. Yeah, I think that to me, that's, you know, the statistics are, I think, 60,000 people die a year uh, from infected wounds and, and sepsis. Uh, and the fact that we can combat that now, we have technology that can overcome that, kill the infection, and heal these wounds. Uh, I think is really exciting and, you know, I think is going to be a legacy play for us in drug development, not only for, you know, many other oral formulations, but the topical uh, wound care drug, I think is going to be really revolutionary. I can see how the military could use it also, not Absolutely. just... And, it, you know. and hyperbaric chambers, and you know, you combine it with the nitric oxide, probably. Absolutely. So, and just one quick question, going back on the breathing, nasal breathing, you know, I've read increase in nitric oxide production. How does that work? And uh, is that actually true? Well, nasal breathing can, not necessarily does. Again, so it goes back to exercise. You know, if you, if, and it's dependent upon the nitric oxide synthase enzyme. So that same enzyme that's found in our endothelial cells is found in our epithelial cells of the airway sinuses. So if that enzyme is coupled and functional, when we take in deep breaths through the nasal sinuses, there's mechanoreceptors on those cells that activate or stimulate nitric oxide production. 
So if you have good endothelial function, good epithelial function, then it'll produce nitric oxide. You can deliver it down to the uh, to bronchial airways, cause smooth muscle relaxation in the, in the bronchioles, and improve oxygen delivery. Uh, however, if you have endothelial dysfunction, then you have epithelial dysfunction. And nasal breathing will not necessarily cause an increase in nitric oxide production. We have to fix the NOS enzyme and recouple it to where when it's activated or stimulated, it can produce nitric oxide. And we've been able to measure this in young kids. You know, my boys are 12 and 14. So when they do nasal breathing, they generate a lot of nitric oxide. If I take my parents who are in their 70s, you know, there's very little or much less doing the same type of nasal breathing. Uh, that's fascinating. How age changes. Well, that's, that's all because of the NOS goes down the night. The, is no, that- that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah, there's an age-related decline in the function of that enzyme, and it's multifactorial. You know, most of it is, not surprisingly, diet and lifestyle-related leads to the oxidation of tetrahydrobotrin, which uncouples the enzyme. There's some genetic SNPs that uh, predispose you to nitric oxide deficiency. Obviously, if you have a SNP in the, the ENOS enzyme itself, then, you know, that protein's not going to be functional. The other one is the MTHFR, the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. Uh, SNP, you know, that's enzyme is responsible for reducing bioptrin to tetrahydrobotrin, which is then the rate limiting step in, in nitric oxide production. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, we didn't know about that, that that is a very interesting information. And do you see it, you know, because 50% of the population has. A... No, that's right. But yeah, in which report you read, you know, it's 45 to 50% of the um, U.S. population has a. You know, either heterozygous or homozygous single nucleotide polymorphism in that MTHFR enzyme. So then those patients, by definition, have endothelial dysfunction because they're unable to recouple the NOS enzyme and make nitric oxide in the epithelium or in the endothelium. Hmm. So what, what's your estimation of the, you know, adult Americans that are deficient in nitric oxide? Do you think it's a majority of people? Yeah, I estimate that it's probably, you know, three out of four people, you know, across all age groups. You know, this is generally speaking, you know, because when we look at our biological age, right, we really can't do much about our chronological age, right. <laughs> unfortunately, but we can certainly do something about our biological age. You know, I just turned 49 in uh, November, but if you do vascular endothelial test on me, I have a vascular age of a, you know, a 34, 35 year old. And so you see that, you know, in 17, 18, 20-year-old kids that have the vascular age of a 40 or 50-year-old, right? So a lot of this is dependent upon diet and lifestyle. But certainly, we're not getting healthier, right? The U.S. population continues to be the sickest population on Earth. And it's, I think it's dependent upon diet, lifestyle, environmental exposures, um, you know, glyphosate worked by Stephanie Sinnott is to clearly show that the residual glyphosate on vegetables is uncoupling NOS, leading to nitric oxide deficiency. Even some evidence now of 5G, that frequency, you know, provides the vibration that uncouples nitric oxide synthase. And, you know, some people are extremely sensitive to that. So it appears that everything we do as Americans, from the standard Western diet to, you know, lack of physical activity, not sweating, exposure to environmental toxicants, um, is leading to a NOS uncoupling and making us nitric oxide deficient, which then accelerates the onset and progression of most, if not all, chronic disease. So NOS is a ma- sounds like it's a major marker of lifestyle. You're, Absolutely. Yeah. And it's uh, if your lifestyle is good, your NOS is going to go up. And, you know, we, we're very focused on this. Our son is a permaculture farmer in North Carolina, and he's very focused on the quality of the, the soil you know, we, we don't have a way to measure, you know, when we buy foods, we, ha- we don't have a way to measure quality. We know if they're organic, non-organic, but we don't know how the, the soil quality is. And this is important to what you said earlier. That's why you were saying that the same celery sold in the, and it's not the same celery quality. So- no, you said Texas is better than New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So he acts like quantifiably, yeah. yeah. But, um, You know, there's data that I've seen from 1941 to 2015, there's been a 70% reduction in trace minerals and nutrients in the vegetables grown 
in the U.S. So this pressure of feeding a growing global population has been at the expense of nutrient density. Uh, you know, we did. I live on 800 acres in the middle of Texas, kind of central Texas, and so we we raise our own beef, we raise our own pork, we grow our own vegetables, uh, but we sample the soil. You know, every couple of years, I'll do a soil sample and get a complete soil analysis, so I know what's missing in it, what may be, you know, overproduced in it, so we can neutralize the soil and optimize the growing conditions. So there need vegetables that we grow in the soil or the grass that my cows eat that we then you know, slaughter for beef production uh, is optimized for nutrient density. Yeah, that's, you know, our son does the same thing. He met, he tests his soil and he basically grows soil then to, before he, he plants anything. So it's a, that's right. you know, you have to have really good soil. And that, yeah, that's what we, it, it's, so there's I, a joke out here that cattle ranchers, uh, like I got a couple hundred head of cattle, really all we are are grass farmers, right? We have to grow the grass. Right, right, right. <laughs> But you've got to, you know, you've got to have good soil to grow good grass to graze the cattle. Yeah, and then we gonna get it, those nitrates in anyway through the, right. even through the beef. So for our patients that want to use your products, how do they get them? Is there a website? Is there some place where they can go to? Sure. So the the nutritional products are found at no2u.com. That's no the number two the letter u.com. Yeah, we'll put a link. Yeah, and we'll give your uh, listeners ten uh, percent off and free shipping, and, and give you guys a coupon code. And then for those of you interested in skincare, uh, you know that's n one o one dot com, uh, one nitrogen, one oxygen dot com, n one o one dot com. I strongly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, you're you're a, you're a walking testimony. Look at your beautiful skin, both of you. Well, Brian, we don't want to keep you any longer. We really appreciate the time. This was fascinating. I hopefully we, we can do this again soon. But uh, good luck with all your ventures. I mean, you're helping so many people with your your research, and uh, we really appreciate this. Thank you for being with us today. And of course, thank you guys. It's always an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. <laughs>